JetBrains, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about several Rust Rover features. But uh, Rust Rover is IDE for Rust, and before I'm going to the features, I will tell you a little bit like the most important thing about Rust Rover. So Rust Rover is free for non-commercial use, your pet projects, learning Rust, whatever, it is free for you. But we also have several different licenses for commercial use. So please feel free to use them and, uh, well, features. So just a small selection of features. Of course, we have millions of them, almost millions. Feature number one here. So we have our own in-house code analysis. And uh, in this example, I show you. So for example, you are trying to create a structure, but there are no structure literal like this one. So it's a mistake. Rust Rover is able to look at the definition of the box type, find that there is a new method there, and we can suggest it so you can just, uh, in one click, get the call to the new method. So we try to understand what you are up to here, and then give you suggestion how it must look like. Feature number two, we integrate with the Rust C, for example, here you have some error with lifetimes. And if you run compiler, there will be a suggestion to change something in your code. And look, we have apply fix button right there in the compiler output. And if you press it, the result will be automatically applied to your code. So you don't have to do it by yourself. It's all implemented in Rust Trova. So we integrate with Rust C. Feature number three. We have full support for coding, editing your dependencies in Cargo Tomal. For example, here you have several dependencies. You can get a lot of information at this screen. You see the latest version available. You can update your dependency right here without actually writing any code. But one feature that I'd like to showcase here. For example, you want to add some uh, feature for your crate. Look, you just it is enough to type F there, and then you will get full suggestion. And of course, there will be code completion for available features of that crate. So we, we try, once again, we try to understand what you are up to in this particular scenario in this file, and then we give you meaningful suggestions. So we want you to write your code in a very fast way. You don't have to think at all. Uh, feature number four, we have very powerful interactive debugger. And in that debugger, you can even change values of mutable variables. And then you can replay your code. For example, here in this example, you see there is a breakpoint. Your program is suspended at this breakpoint. But then there is also this orange arrow. You can see it there in the gutter on the left-hand side. And that arrow means you are at this point in time in this program. And you can drag this arrow back, and then you just replay the same code fragment with another value of that mutable variable. So if you debug some code with algorithms, for example, this is particularly uh, useful. So you just check, well, if, it's, if this variable has some different value, maybe there is some error here. So you try, replay this fragment, and you get understanding of what's going on in your code. Finally, feature number five. Uh, we have a local uh, large language model working on the background in your Astrova and try to complete code fragment. Of course, we have usual code completion, like you see like local layout, something like that. But then there is also some gray code there and you press stop to complete the full line. So Rastrova tries to understand what, what you are supposed to write here, because here, like, the name of the function is days between dates, and that means that chances are you will have two dates there in the arguments. So we see that, and we give you useful suggestion. And one more thing I wanted to mention here. We hear you. And uh, for example, we've added full support for web front-end technologies and database recently, something we had before our release, and then 
we added back. So now you can use full front-end support in Rust Trova, full data bus, uh, database sub support, nothing, nothing else required. Everything is already there. And we also, we value your feedback. We wait for your bug reports, feature requests. Please go to our your track. There are items in our menu. Submit your feedback. We wait for it. We need it. Thank you very much. Rastrova, focus on what matters. Hey everyone, I'm Max, and uh, this is my co-founder Antonio, um, and uh, we're two of the three co-founders of Zed. Uh, if you haven't seen us yet, Zed is a is a open source code editor that's um, we're focused on speed. Uh, we um, and we're we're written in Rust, and we're we're here at RustConf with our whole team. Uh, we're a remote team, and we're after. Um, Tomorrow, we're hosting an event where we're, we're, we're inviting you all to come hack on our open source code editor with us. And so we thought we'd just come up here and uh, give you a tour of Zed in five modules or so, or however many we can get to in this, uh, this lightning talk. Um, so, yeah, I'll pass the mic to Antonio. Yeah, so um, one of our core features is speed. And so, um, yeah, one... To make the editor fast, what we did is to build our own UI framework in using GPU acceleration to, to build it. And so like, uh, one cool thing that we do is uh, we integrate with the operating system to um, open uh, a window, but all that gives us is like a canvas into which we can rasterize um, um, the shapes that we want to build, that we want to draw on screen. And so uh, you can see here, like, this is a... Uh, one shader that we use, which is uh, uh, the quad. So one of the basic primitives we have in Zed is being able to, to draw rectangles. And to do that, we use a cool technique called SDFs, uh, sign distance functions or sign distance fields. And the thought is that uh, in parallel for every pixel, we're able to calculate the distance for, uh, of that pixel from the shape that we want to build. And with that, we're able to uh, in parallel decide which color that pixel needs to be. So that's what helps us uh, leverage the GPU and um, render the UI at 120 frames per second. Um, so yeah, this is uh, the, an example of one SDF. Um, yeah, I don't know, like we calculate here like float distance, distance from the pixel to, uh, to, to the shape that we wanna build. This is a metal shader, and we also have some um, WebGSL shaders that we use for um, Web GPU shaders that we use uh, use on Linux. Uh, next module we'll, we'll show you is is the rope. This is uh, at the core of Zed, how we we represent text itself. Um, so if you're not familiar with the rope, it's a way of representing a large mutable piece of text in a tree structure, um, and this is. Um, kind of enables all kinds of performance optimizations that we do in Zed that we can um, cheaply clone the rope by bumping its reference count and process it on a background thread. And we can also seek to arbitrary um, positions um, in both byte offsets and, and row column coordinates uh, because of the way that we index the rope. Um, and a cool thing about the rope is that it's implemented in terms of this even more generic B2 data structure called the sum tree. Um, Pass the mic. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, the sum tree is like basically the backbone of Zed. We use it everywhere, and it's our answer to how you represent sequences efficiently. Um, and basically, it lets us. You can see here, like the definition of uh, the sum tree is um, here. Max, can you navigate to uh, sum tree? Yeah. Um, yeah. The definition of a sum tree is basically like uh, a pointer to uh, a node. Um, that's okay. You just um, yeah, so it's a, a pointer to a node, and the node um, is basically, um, yeah, an enum. So it can be an internal node or a leaf node. That's a standard B plus tree. But the cool thing is that the node is generic over a, a, a T, a type item. And each item can define uh, its own summary. 
What that means is that like you can store a bunch of items, whatever they are, and like uh, you can query uh, what we call dimensions of those items. So for example, in the rope, uh, we're able to store the text chunks, but um, on the side in the, in the sum tree, we're able to store like all the bytes and for example, all the uh, points, like so 2D coordinates as well as like uh, one dimensional coordinates and we're able to query that information in uh, log n time, which is really cool. And then the cool thing is that there's just tons of other sequences that come up in Z that we can also represent using the sum tree. One example is um, uh, we have this construct called a multi-buffer, which is sort of our way of showing excerpts from multiple files. Can you actually do a find all refs on one of these things? Um, so yeah, we're, we're sh this is a multi-buffer in Z, and so we, we're showing excerpts from arbitrary numbers of files in your code base all in one editable list. So it's not just a search results view, which is just showing you kind of a dump of text. These are all editable. You can edit and save these. You can even collaboratively edit these uh, in Z. And so anyway, um, we're about at time, but um, these, these excerpts we also can represent efficiently using the same sum tree. Uh, so it's pretty, uh, pretty elegant. Uh, I think we're at time, so I just want to close by, um, we, you know, we just threw a lot of code at you. It's, you know, probably like hard to understand, but I like, I would love it if um, any of you who are around tomorrow would just come hack on our, on our editor with us. We, we'll do anything uh, you want. You know, we're here to kind of basically, um, you know, talk to all of you and uh, hack with the Rust community. So, so come by, we have flyers downstairs at our booth for where it's at. If you don't have time tomorrow, do, you, we're open source online. Um, come, come hack with us on our thing. Thank you. Th thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Sacker. I'm the head of software at K2 Space. We're a startup based out of Los Angeles, California, designing and building satellites. So uh, before I get started, I just want to say hi. Welcome to everybody here at RustConf, both in person and joining us online virtually. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit today about the how, what, and why of K2 Space. I only have five minutes, so it's going to be super brief. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. So a little bit of the, uh, the future we want. Uh, what we're trying to do at K2 Space is improve the infrastructure and capabilities of our satellite technology in space. If we're thinking about the first steps we would take, what that immediate future looks like, it is satellites and constellations around Earth. The easiest part of space for us to get to, right? Uh, as we get better and uh, look to expand further, that will go to other bodies in our solar system. So if we think a little bit further, one of the first things that comes up is Mars. Uh, so that would be constellations around Mars, getting infrastructure to communicate back to Earth. And then if we put our sci-fi hats on and start thinking uh, a little bit further out, extrapolating deep into what could be, uh, yeah, we get into the more sci-fi use cases, things like a Dyson Sphere down there. To speak a little bit more explicitly at what that would look like in terms of uh, discrete types of infrastructure and pieces of technology, that would be things like probes and orbiters around all moons and bodies in our solar system, uh, 15 meter plus space observatories, large telescopes, getting to know and catalog all of the things in our solar system uh, so that if something were to happen, we'd be able to track it early and not be caught off guard and surprised by it, right? Um, optical, inter uh, optical interstellar communications networks, optical being a great technology to reduce transmit times and get things uh, communicated from one point to another quite reliably and quickly. Uh, landers on habitable worlds and ultimately sustaining human presence on the moon, Mars, uh, other planets and bodies and making sure that we're able to operate in a fashion that all of our favorite sci-fi books are able to as well. Um, part of the reason why that's not being able to happen today is that we kind of are operating on two spectrums uh, of satellites right now. So on one end, we have the high capability, high power, high cost. And so this is where we get the like greater than 1,000 kilograms mass, greater than 15 kilowatts of array power, greater than 100 million US dollars. So these take a lot of time to make. They're very expensive, but they are very capable, right? On the other end of the spectrum, you get the limited capabilities. So that's less than 300 kilograms, less than five kilowatts but less than 15 million US dollars, a lot more approachable. This is where a lot of the startups in the satellite industry 
industry are entering because you know when you have that smaller price point it's a lot easier to get started um, what we're trying to do is come up with a new approach vector and so we have this high capability satellite greater than 1,000 kilograms, more than 15 kilowatts of power at that low price point. And that is our mega class satellite. This is a satellite we're working on right now. We're expecting to launch it. We have a launch date uh, to be no, uh, no earlier than end of next year, 2025. It's a pretty quick timeline and we're working pretty hard to make that happen. Everything's looking great so far. And we have some hardware set to go into space later this year. Uh, so what is this mega class satellite going to be doing? We have 20 kilowatts of array power. We have over 1,000 kilograms of payload mass. And we're innovating on a number of factors. One of them that's always fun to talk about is we're working on the highest power electric propulsion system that's ever going to be flown in space by a factor of four. So this is a really big step. And this is just a number of things that we're doing to innovate and get better, help drive that cost down, and increase our capabilities. Uh, while other companies are looking at just staying in low Earth orbit, again, that's the lowest that you would get to. It's where the space station is. It's where a lot of the satellites that we have in Earth, uh, in orbit over Earth today are. Uh, our satellites are being designed to, to be operated and survive in any orbital profile. So low Earth orbit, mid-Earth orbit, geostationary orbit, and then deep space, right? There's a lot that we want to do and that is interesting to do that is not really around Earth. If we think about Mars, Right, like that, that there's a long transit time there. It takes a, a lot of things to go right to survive there, get and function and operate successfully there. And we're trying to get this done across the board with the same satellite design. So we don't have to create a new bespoke satellite for every mission. It's the same one off the line. We customize it maybe a little bit for the payload and we get it out the door. Um, one other thing to, to note is uh, people start thinking like, oh, well, you're designing this really complex system. You have to get it into space. Are you designing for a single launch vehicle? What happens if that launch vehicle company has some sort of issues? Uh, well, we're not designing for a single launch vehicle because we want to be able to have some sort of confidence that if something were to happen in the industry, we're not going to be affected. So our mega class satellite is being designed to operate and fly on a number of launch vehicles in existence and in operation today. If we were to take one example of the Falcon 9, we can fit 10 of our mega class satellites on one Falcon 9 launch. So that enables us to get a lot of satellites to get a, an acceleration factor on our constellations uh, because we're able to get more satellites per launch. It also helps the bottom line of being a little bit of a cheaper option since launch vehicles, while they're cheaper than they've ever been, the cost of access to space is as cheap as it's ever been. Uh, it's still not cheap by you know, my standards or your standards paying out of pocket. So then why are we here? How are we getting there with Rust? Our entire software stack is Rust. All the software that's on our launch vehicle is being written in Rust. Obviously that percolates down to things on the ground. So guidance navigation algorithms, embedded products, everything coordinating from our vehicles, fault tolerance, detection, recovery, test assets, end to end. Uh, unfortunately, that takes me to time. We have a booth downstairs. I'm happy to speak more to any of you that want to swing by. Thank you so much for coming. We're hiring and really appreciate your time today.